If you think it was morally justifiable for- It's amazing how quickly the people in the comments of many commenters asked what we would rather Truman have done. If you were President Truman in the summer of 1945, what would you have done? No, we didn't need to invade. That's a lie that was told by Truman and just repeated throughout history. We didn't need to nuke them. They were already going to surrender. Hot take. Innocent people don't deserve to get nuked. They were planning to bomb five cities in total. I double check my sources, which is this picture you see in the background. You cannot prove this statement that Japan would not have surrendered if we didn't drop two nukes on them. They were given the opportunity to surrender unconditionally. Your evidence trying to justify this is saying every Japanese civilian was ready to fight to the death with bamboo. Stalin was set to attack Japan in mid-August, that that would be the shock needed. Please, everyone watch this video and stop using American exceptionalism to justify mass murder. And we need to take the time to examine ourselves and work out whether we are being rational in our morality. It may be time to consider that you've been brainwashed by your government. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. Okay, I'm going to address every single one of these concerns in this single video, and by the end, I believe any one of you will understand that dropping the A-bombs, yes, a war crime by any definition, of an incomprehensible scale, was not only the only real decision any sane person could have made, but it was also the most humanitarian choice President Harry S. Truman could have made. I can imagine you retorting with, How dare you try to justify the indiscriminate mass murder of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians? There was no moral rationale now Americans were murderers, genocidal mass murderers that is. The thing is, if the alternative was all rainbows and unicorns, you'd be right to call me out. If the alternative was Hirohito and Truman shaking hands, agreeing to put aside their differences, stand down all their soldiers and perhaps most importantly, close the lid of Pandora's jar right before the escape of the apocalyptic nuclear spirit, sure, you're right, what a monster Truman was. But that wasn't exactly the reality, was it. The problem with all these modern analysts, like the clips I played to you at the beginning of the video, is that they pretend that the war crime that was the dropping of the atomic bombs happened in a vacuum, choosing to ignore the unassailable fact that it was merely the last of the war crimes from a period of history where war crimes were happening every single day since before the war actually started. The problem is, by ignoring the obvious military use of the bombs and the overwhelming support from the rank and file, people risk implanting their modern worldviews and distortions onto the world of August 1945. My approach, meanwhile, is to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who were actually there, work out what information was available to them, what type of world they inhabited, and what was happening at the time, and in doing so we can work out their motives, and truly understand whether the atomic bombs are justified or not. <laughs> Historian Barton Bernstein proposed that all these people looking to the topic should carefully distinguish quote, what did Truman and his top associates know and believe before Hiroshima about the likely ending of the war, end quote, and what did post-Hiroshima analysts, including government personnel, conclude would probably have happened at the ending of the war if the bombs had not been used, end quote. And I would personally also like you to ask yourself, what would you do if you were Truman? Let's place yourself in the mindset of summer 1945. The entire world has gone crazy. Everyone's been at war with everyone else for the past six years and it's the worst war there's ever been. Perhaps 70 million people have died. 70 million! Sure, Germany has been defeated, but that took 10 million deaths to accomplish. This is no time for jubilation. That's because you've still got this enemy in the Pacific who are just as formidable Imperial Japan. They're responsible for some of the worst atrocities of the war. Who could forget the rape of Nanking? 300,000 people dead in a single city. The massacre of the former US colony of Manila, perhaps half a million dead. Added together, they're probably responsible for the death of 25 million people. Every day you don't defeat them, another 8 to 15 thousand innocent non-Japanese civilians are being killed by this brutal regime. I would think about using the word meat grinder here, but I'm not sure if it conveys the horror. It's the extermination of an entire arena full of non-Japanese civilians every two days. So one should ask, were they on the verge of defeat from the American point of view? All I can say is, 
It doesn't look like it. They didn't surrender when they lost four aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway. They didn't surrender when they lost the rest of the Navy at the Great Marianas Turkish shoot. They didn't surrender when they lost Saipan, opening the Japanese homeland to the American B-29 bombers. And they didn't surrender when said bombers completely leveled 65 out of the 67 major cities of Japan. Furthermore, the rhetoric coming out of Japan wasn't too promising either. At this time, phrases like like, quote, 100 million souls dying for honor, end quote, and quote, the glorious death of 100 million, end quote, was on every Japanese lips. This was preparation for Operation Ketsugo and called up for the entire population of Japan to its defense, training women and children to take out Americans by striking them with bamboo sticks. The men, meanwhile, were taught to man kamikaze torpedoes along with specially designed one way aircraft. I don't think for one minute that those words were empty. Historian Richard Frank said, quote, Virtually every Japanese unit fought to near annihilation, a record unparalleled in modern history. Voluntary surrenders were rare. More often, prisoners were the only Japanese left by wounds or debilitation, too helpless to take their own lives, end quote. Who could forget Saipan too? on that little island in the middle of the Pacific. More than 30,000 Japanese died. Do you want to guess how many surrendered? 60,000? 100,000? No. 1,500. Just 1,500. And that also includes civilians. Robert B. Sheeks writes, quote, There were instances of suicide and nearly every civilian as well as every soldier had been issued one or more grenades with instructions to save one for suicide at the end. Almost to a man, Japanese civilians and a large part of the Korean and natives held the belief that capture meant hideous torture, end quote, and killed themselves they did, quote, Several groups of young men and women of the youth associations banded together at the top of cliffs. They sang patriotic songs and leapt into the sea. Some families threw themselves over cliffs and in caves there were a number of suicides with grenades or knives." End quote. This expectation of a cultural suicide reminds me of the story of Hiro Onoda, one of the many Japanese soldiers who didn't surrender for years after the war had finished. In fact, Hiro didn't surrender for another 29 years, and that's despite being bombarded with leaflets and newspapers telling him that Japan had lost the war and had surrendered. And that's because from his understanding, if Japan had truly lost the war, there shouldn't be a Japan to return to. In his ghost-written book, talking about the 100 million souls dying for honor propaganda, he said, quote, I took this at face value, and I'm sure many other Japanese men my age did. I sincerely believe that Japan would not surrender, so as long as one Japanese remained alive. Conversely, if one Japanese were left alive, Japan would not have surrendered, end quote. How do you fight an enemy like this? an enemy where civilians and soldiers are indistinguishable from one another. Americans already had a taste of this conundrum at Saipan. Robert Sheeks wrote, quote, The only clothing available to civilians consisted primarily of discarded military uniforms or work uniforms of this same colour. This clothing created a serious problem for the United States troops who found it very difficult during the campaign to distinguish Japanese civilians from military personnel. End quote. We also have to remember that the civilians of Saipan and later Okinawa, unlike the bamboo-wielding mainlanders, were oppressed people from the Japanese colonies with questionable loyalty. If Saipan and later Okinawa were bad, was already like Armageddon, what would facing 77 native Japanese on their homeland be like? It wouldn't be pretty. The US War Department's estimates for Japanese casualties for an invasion of Japan ominously named Operation Downfall were absolutely frightening. They estimated it would cost America 4 million casualties. I also want to add, when are casualty estimates ever accurate? Imagine being Truman and having to tell your war-weary people, all those families already torn by war, or who had already lost sons, telling all those mothers and fathers that Germany was only a prologue, and you have to give up four million more of your precious kids because the worst is yet to come. Japan's fanatical suicide war and desperation air attacks inflicted heavy damage on American naval forces off Okinawa. This was Kamikaze. It was sensational, but it would never stop the Allied advance.
Truman, isn't it your job as president to save these people, your own people? Isn't the protection of your own people, protecting the lives of your next generation, who are going to run the country someday, your highest priority? Because if it isn't, if putting the lives of your enemy in a total war ahead of the lives of your own sons and brothers isn't treachery, I don't know what is. Because this is the alternative of not dropping the bombs. Saving 4 million Americans from war casualties is probably enough justification to use the bombs alone. But I haven't even scratched the surface of the human misery an invasion of Japan would unleash on the Japanese. <laughs> I don't ever want to downplay the incredible human suffering that A-bombs inflicted. As I've repeated many times, it was a terrible war crime. But in the Second World War, even war crimes are all relative. We have to compare the 200,000 to the number of Japanese civilian deaths had the bombs not been used and an invasion had taken place instead. I've thrown around the number 100 million, but obviously that's just a propagandist figure. Can we actually determine a more realistic number? I think we can look at the invasion of Okinawa, the largest Japanese colony with a population of 500,000. It was also the site of the last great battle of World War II. Now the cost to take this road relatively small island is almost impossible to comprehend. America and its allies suffered a massive 50,000 casualties. That's one death or grievous injury for every 10 civilians on that island. And the Japanese? Numbers are vague, but probably twice that, so 100,000. So that's three casualties for every 10 civilians. These are unfathomable numbers. Let's apply that to the mainland that has a population of probably about 77 million at this time. Assuming it's as difficult to take over as Okinawa, by the way, I would argue it'd be much, much harder. That's 23 million casualties for the militaries. These are just military casualties. What recorded history often leaves out are the civilian effects and oh my. Daniel Glasmeyer writes, quote, the magnitude and impact of early occupation on the Okinawa invasion have been underrepresented and obscured. The seppuku, or ritual suicide, of Japanese General Ushijima is commonly recorded, but the reported number of civilian dead varies from 40,000 to 140,000, or one third of the pre war population. That the number of civilian dead should be so contested indicates the problem of representation that surrounds this history. End quote. Many civilians died tragically by accident, by being caught in unevacuated battle areas, by being victims of atrocities committed by both sides, but an often ignored group, quote, are those attributed to self-killing. Hundreds, if not thousands of Okinawans took their own lives, not, according to recent accounts, in loyalty to the emperor, but in despairing self-defense prompted by the fear of surrender to Americans. This part of history barely registers in American coverage or consciousness. Awareness of Okinawan civilians' plight contrasts strongly with the attention paid by the US popular culture to victims of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Okay. End quote. So the invasion not only cost three military casualties for every 10 civilians, but also the death of one in three civilians. I'm sorry, but I'm just speechless at these numbers. And don't for one minute think that this was a one-off. These scenes from Okinawa are just a repeat from Saipan a year earlier. When that battle ended, quote, civilian families and Japanese troops huddled in caves in what are now known as the suicide cliffs facing the oceans there, many refusing to exit, even as mop-up teams called in Japanese and Okinawan for them to surrender. Occasionally, a historian would assert that whole families would storm to the front of a cave and fling themselves over the cliffs to their death. More often, one finds reports of families dying huddled around Japanese-issued hand grenades or patriarchs beating their wives and children to death, then strangling or stabbing themselves, of bodies of the elderly and infants alike heaped upon one another." End quote. Okinawa native experts estimate that 140,000 civilians out of a total population of 400,000 died during that battle double that number to include Japanese soldiers, and suddenly the slogan, the glorious death of 100 million doesn't seem so far-fetched anymore. 
If we are to use this ratio to calculate the possible amount of civilian deaths if the Japanese mainland was to be invaded, we would have the number 27 million. 27 million civilian deaths! And don't forget to add many million more to include the deaths of Japanese soldiers. I also want to repeat that Okinawa and Saipan were colonies with civilian populations not trained for defense. If you thought they were bad, imagine how bad the mainland would be like. All one sacred family created to rule the whole world. Created to rule the whole world. George Pfeiffer suggests that the unfathomable suffering in Okinawa prompted the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And honestly, after experiencing that, if you were Truman who were presented with these new A-bombs that have a very good chance of shocking the Japanese into surrender, with the guarantee of tens of millions of more deaths if you don't use them, you would drop them, wouldn't you? I know that saying that nuking 200,000 people is the better choice is an abhorrent way of looking at things and is morally reprehensible, but in light of the numbers in the tens of millions if you don't use them, I don't see how anyone could have made a different choice. At this point, I'm certain there's plenty of people out there ready to comment. But Japan were already militarily defeated. They were on the verge of surrendering. Sure, I will admit, they were militarily outmatched. But you could honestly say that their chances of winning the war ended with their failure at the Battle of the Coral Sea three years before these nukes. Or perhaps it was at the Battle of Midway just a month later. Japan was relying on having aircraft carrier superiority and thus when they lost four out of their six aircraft carriers in one battle, there goes their chances of winning the war. They were militarily defeated then and they didn't surrender. And they didn't surrender at the loss of the Marianas, the Great Turkish Route, the horrendous Burma campaign and the firebombing of all their major cities. How can you expect that the Americans would assume that they would suddenly surrender in July or August of 1945? Speaking about this late stage of the war, Glassmeyer writes, quote, Japanese military commanders had no illusions about winning. It was a fight to the death with no retreat possible and surrender a cultural impossibility. They were charged with making the battle as costly to the United States as possible. The goal was to delay or even to cause a reconsideration of the US invasion of Japan, end quote. And there you go. Japan's plan to end the war isn't by militarily defeating the US. They expanded their territory in a supernova-like explosion in 1941 and hoped to make the idea of pushing them back militarily a task so unenviable and so daunting the soft and decadent Americans wouldn't have the stomach to do it. This was also the reason why simply demonstrating the bomb on a farm or over water wouldn't have the desired effects because this was simply plain to the Japanese idea of the softness of the Americans. Sure, they technically have the power to beat us, but they don't have the stomach to do so. All the better for us Japanese, who are sturdier, more hardy, more resilient. It's only a matter of time before they give up. And if they don't, dying in glory of war is a suitable way to go. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. Another popular line that I hear about 10 times a day in my TikTok comments is Japan surrendered because of the entry of Russia into the war and not the atomic bomb. Meaning that the bombs were completely unnecessary and thus these 200,000 deaths should have been avoided. This thinking became popular with historians like Alerovitz and Meza who were famous for pulling out quotes like this one. General George Marshall who famously said in a special White House meeting on the 18th of June 1945 quote the impact of Russian entry on the already hopeless Japanese may well be the decisive action levering them into capitulation." End quote. Wow, that sounds like a smoking gun, doesn't it? However, the quote doesn't end there. It ends with, levering them into capitulation at that time or shortly thereafter if we land in Japan. End quote. Furthermore, five paragraphs earlier in the minutes gives more clarity on his position. Quote, if the Japanese are ever willing to capitulate short of complete Japanese defeat in the field, they would do it when faced by the completely hopeless prospect occasioned by one destroyed
destruction already wrought by air bombardment and sea blockade, coupled with two, a landing on Japan indicating the firmness of our resolution, and also perhaps coupled with three, the entry or threat of entry of Russia into the war. End quote. In short, General Marshall, whose words are the Bible to those believing that Russia's entry into the war was the reason for Japanese surrender, himself believed that for the Soviet entry into the war to be decisive, it required the November American invasion too. Bernstein writes, quote, for Marshall and most of his listeners at the high-level White House meeting, the invasion did seem necessary. For them, Soviet entry was not a substitute for invasion. Soviet entry was not defined as an alternative way of ending the war, but Soviet entry could be a supplement to an invasion. And they hoped the bomb would obviate the need for invasion. End quote. Alerovitz and Meza also bring up that on July 6, 1945, there was a report from the Combined Intelligence Committee that said, quote, an entry of the Soviet Union into the war would finally convince the Japanese of the inevitability of complete defeat. End quote. But as we've discussed already, the Japanese have known since at least Saipan a year earlier of the inevitability of their defeat. And even if this was the moment they finally realized, this date of recognition of defeat and their actual surrender could take months. And that's even if it happened at all. For example, Germany's defeat was inevitable since at least early 1944, but they didn't surrender until May 45, an entire year later. And this would obviously mean that the dreaded November invasion of Japan will have to happen. Okay, but unconditional surrender. If that wasn't a term, they wouldn't have fought on till the end. Look. This argument can only be made with decades of hindsight. At the time, unconditional surrender was seen as critical because everyone just saw what happens when you allow a country to retain some power. Everyone learned the hard way that Nazi Germany is what happens when you don't get unconditional surrender. And it was critical to everyone who was affected by Japan's brutal empire that unconditional surrender happened, especially China. And let's also consider that renegotiation the surrender terms could have had a very real chance of reaffirming the Japanese view that the US were weak and could give hope to the Japanese to strive for even more concessions, prolonging the war even further. Truman and the American allies could not have known which direction it would have went. Okay, so the Japanese perhaps didn't surrender because of the Soviets and redefining surrender terms may not have produced a surrender, but they were definitely trying to surrender to the Soviets. I mean, America even intercepted some secret cables right okay let's look at them foreign minister tojo on the 30th july sent this telegram to sato in moscow quote it is difficult to decide on concrete peace conditions here in Tokyo all at once. We are exerting ourselves to collect the views of all quarters on the matter of concrete terms. Here's another one intercepted a few days later on the 3rd of August. Quote, so as long as you propose sending a special envoy to Moscow without at the same time having concrete plans for ending the war, the Russians will refuse. End quote. So what does that mean? I'll quote Bernstein for this, quote, Despite Sato's admonitions, the best a foreign office could do up to the time of Hiroshima bombing was to decide to send an envoy which would carry terms. Those terms had not been defined, end quote. I think it's also important to understand that the Japanese government at the time was often called a government of assassination where pacifist ministers were often targeted by the military for, well, assassination. So even if they were certain people looking for peace, if they did succeed, there was a very good chance of them being assassinated in another military coup. So even on the eve of the bombs, the Japanese government couldn't even stipulate terms, and thus every minister except for Yonai, the navy minister, wanted to continue the war. After the war, the surviving ministers did claim they were secretly advocating for peace. Yeah. Sure. We have to understand that Japan's surrender was the result of extraordinary circumstances. Circumstances so powerful and desperate it could unite the very fractured, unstable and pro-war Japanese cabinet. The dropping of the two atomic bombs were a vital part of swaying and uniting the seemingly immovable government. People have also mentioned to me that Truman's Potsdam diary entries are evidence that he knew that the Russians would end the war. After Potsdam, we saw 
Stalin promised that the Soviets would intervene in the Pacific Theater on the 15th of August 1945, Truman wrote, quote, finished Japs when that comes about, end quote. So it seems that he thought that the Soviets would end the war immediately, right? Well, no, because he clarifies this diary entry when he wrote to his wife when he believed, quote, we'll end the war a year sooner now, end quote. He obviously admitted that the Soviets would help end the war sooner, but sooner could mean November, it could mean 1946. Not exactly immediate, is it? On July 18, however, after finding out that the Trinity test was successful, he wrote in his diary, quote, Believe Japs will fold up before Russia comes in. I am sure they will when Manhattan appears over their homeland, end quote. And there we have it. The Japanese were militarily overwhelmed, but there was no good evidence that they were on the verge of surrendering. The Soviet invasion could eventually convince the Japanese to surrender, but only if America did so also. The bomb was used, so neither the Russians nor the Americans needed to invade the mainland. And yet I can still hear people asking more what ifs. The thing is, most of these what ifs would involve the process of waiting and seeing. But I want you to understand how desperate everyone was to end the war as quickly as possible. Because sure, we can wait a few months to see whether using the only two atomic bombs in existence over rice paddies will convince the Japanese to surrender or seeing the effectiveness of the Soviet invasion. But we also have to remember that thousands and thousands of soldiers and civilians are dying every single day the war goes on. I'm going to quote Dan Carlin, talking about the attitude of the generals who saw, quote, the major nasty part of modern war is its length. And because the casualties mounted every single day, like a meat grinder, Anything you could do to shut that down and limit the amount of time the war went on was humanitarian in its very nature. Even if what it took to do that was a shocking amount of violence in a short time to shock them into peace. End quote. I also like the way Malcolm Gladwell describes this predicament in his book Bomber Mafia describing how Curtis LeMay, the person behind these hideously awful firebombing campaigns across Japan, which were just as destructive as the nukes. Imagining how LeMay would justify the firebombing, Gladwell writes, quote, Well, he would have said it was the responsibility of a military leader to make wars as short as possible, that it was the duration of war and not the techniques of war that caused suffering. If you cared about the lives of your men and the pain inflicted on your enemy, then you ought to wage as relentless and decisive and devastating a war as you could. Because if being relentless, decisive and devastating turned a two-year war into a one-year war, isn't that the most desirable outcome?" End quote. I know this sounds awful, but from a generation who grew up with the horrors and experienced the human cost of attrition of the four-year conflict that was World War I, never again they said, only to experience an even longer and even more devastating conflict that was World War II. If you were a humanitarian and wanted to save as many lives as possible, the drive to make wars as short as possible is the logical ideological result. Look, I know how hard it is to look at these 200,000 deaths, not to be horrified, but trust me, years of total war, years with tens of millions of people dying, hundreds of millions being displaced will utterly change your perspective. I know it's tempting to judge our forefathers for these obvious terrible war crimes and to be convinced by these alternative reasons for dropping the bombs, but this process risks imposing our decades of hindsight and our modern 21st century peacetime bias onto the drastically different world of 1945. It's very tempting to see the haystack of information and look for single needles of evidence that point in another direction to build an alternative narrative. But remember, hindsight is 2020 and our ancestors were fumbling in the fog of war blind. Thanks for watching.